Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave, and today we're talking about 10 time-saving JavaScript functions. These are utility functions that you can use again and again in multiple projects. Let's get started. Today we're looking at JavaScript utility functions, and utility functions are time savers. They are abstract functions that you can use in many applications over and over again. So in that regard, they're not tied to one application at all, and they're not coupled to a specific data model or a specific interface or view. And in that regard, they are very easy to pull out of one application and use in another as well. So that all leads to how abstract they are. And that's kind of like Batman's utility belt. This is something you can take with you in your tools to basically any project you work on. And of course, some will apply to one project and some will apply to another. But as you go and uh, increase your experience, you'll probably increase your utility belt. So there are several benefits. And the first one is they can add additional functionality that's not built right into JavaScript. We may find a need over and over again and we can just build a function that does that, but it's decoupled from everything in a specific project. And so we can just take it with us to different projects. And the second part is utility functions often are used to just reduce tedious typing and make it a simple function call instead of typing document.getElementById or query selector and things like that over and over and over again, add event listener and, and similar things. Okay, so they're usually kept in their own module and imported. You could view this as your utility belt or a suitcase. And this would be an example of, of course, importing just a couple of functions from a utils.js file. And here we've got proper case and log. And those are a couple of examples, simpler ones that we'll look at to start out with. Also, they could be in a class. And you often see utility classes and there are methods that are called upon. Oftentimes, they'll be called as static methods and you could view those much like you would math random or say JSON stringify. Think of some JavaScript objects that you have to use to call their methods and that is because they're, they're static. They don't have a constructor. They don't keep a state. They're more abstract than that and they won't really change. So if we were to define a class that would have a static function Here's our utils class, and of course there would be more than one function probably, but here's a static my function, and then we would call that into action, much like we do math random or JSON stringify, and here we would have utils.my function. Notice we don't create an instance of the class with the new keyword, we just call it on the class. Now I could do a whole separate tutorial just about static classes, but this is about the utility functions, or they could be stored in a class as methods like that. So let's get on to the top 10, or not necessarily top 10, but 10 functions that I'm going to share today with you. Our first utility function is an example of adding some additional functionality to JavaScript. JavaScript has the two uppercase method for a string, and it also has the two lowercase method. However, it doesn't have a proper case. And of course, that wouldn't always work with a name like McDonald's that has a uppercase letter in not only the first, but also the third position. However, there are many times that I have found a proper case function necessary and so I carry one in my utility belt if you will and here is the proper case function and you can see we're just taking the first character of the string and setting it to uppercase and then of course using a template literal we're just concatenating here and we're slicing the string so taking every bit of the string except the first character and setting it to lowercase and just returning that. So a very simple function, but now even if I would have to use it more than once in an application, I don't have to type all of this, I just have my proper case function. Now before I call that, let's go ahead and look at the second function. You may find this handy or you may find it too simple, but it's just a log function. We're always typing console log. If you want, you can just type log or whatever other word you want to by creating a function that always logs whatever content is passed in. So now, for example, we'll go ahead and log our proper case function 
and we'll pass in the word research that has upper and lower case. And when we save this, let's look at the console, and you can see research is set to proper case. Our third utility function improves the query selector. And here you can see I've just created a function called select, and we pass in the selector, and there's also an optional scope parameter. And here we return and we can use either the scope or document. So if scope doesn't exist as it's optional, then we use document.querySelector. However, if we already have a smaller scope, say we've selected an element and we just want to query within that element, that's where scope comes in. And then we pass in the selector. That is also an argument here for the function. And that makes it much easier than always typing out document.querySelector and typing out the selector. We can just call our select function. So if we do this now on our HTML, I just have a very empty HTML page along with this tutorial. However, we'll just select the body element because it's definitely there. And then we'll go ahead and call our log function and log the body to the console. So let's save this and look at the console. And there is the body element in the console. The next utility function is an add event listener wrapper, which when we're adding an event listener, and especially if we have a selector before that, it can be a lot of typing. And at the same time, we can just shorten all of that up by creating this function. So I've got a function here called listen, and now we're passing in the target for the add event listener, uh, what event we're listening for, a callback function, and then capture, and capture also has a default value of false, so it is optional. The two exclamation marks you see here just makes it uh, insist on a Boolean value here for capture, and that's what it should be, either true or false. So we've got target.addEventListener, we pass in the event, the callback, and optionally we could pass in the capture. So. Let's go ahead and create another function here for, as our callback. Now this could be a utility function as well if we wanted to, but I did not include it in the count. It's also very simple and it's kind of like the previous log function that I created. However, this is specifically to log events as they happen, so it could be used in debugging. You can see we're passing in the event and just logging the event target here. And then, We'll go ahead and call this function. We won't see anything in the console. I'll actually need to click on the body of the page because we're passing in the body as the HTML tag. And then the click is what we're listening for. So that's the event. And then here's the callback, which is our event log function. So I'll go ahead and save this. And now I'll come over here to the console and click. Now here's our page. I've just got it blacked out. But if I click on the body of the page, you can see it logs the target, the event target, to the console. And that's what was intended with our event log. And of course, we could have just logged the event, but I actually put in e.target so we would see the body over here. Our next utility function is used to sanitize input. Now, you could use regex, and there's several ways to sanitize input, or you could try this. And with this function, you may have seen this in one of my previous tutorials because I know I used it at least once but we pass in the input value, whatever that is, and then we create a div element with document.createElement. From there, we set the div.text content to the input value, and then we return the inner HTML of that div. And at that point, we have set it to text content instead of HTML, and so it escapes those characters that we want to escape. So Let's go ahead and have some dirty input here, and this has a script tag in it, and it just says alert, and then cross-site scripting attack, so just throwing in a little bit of JavaScript there that we would not want in an input. And then we've also got an ampersand, and then it just says other values. After that, let's set our clean input to our sanitize input function and pass in the dirty input. From there, we can use our log function to log the clean input. So let's save all of this. And you can see everything now logged over here is escaped. So the less than symbol that we have in the dirty input is now an and LT semicolon. So it's escaped. The same for the greater than. 
And then you can also see the ampersand is escaped. So we're using all of the HTML characters that we should be using to escape those special characters. Our next utility function doesn't add new functionality, but it adds time-saving functionality because when we create an element, we can also add a class to it. And the class name is optional, an optional parameter that we could pass into our create element function. Otherwise, we always have to use document.createElement, and then of course we have to add the class name to the class list. And in this one function, we can just call create element and pass in the tag and the class name. So this is definitely a time saver. And so let's go ahead and create a main element and we'll give it a class of root. And then we'll just append the root variable here that we create to the body. And now we'll save this, and let's go ahead and look at the body that is already logged to the console because that should have changed it. And now you can see we have a main element with a class of root. The seventh utility function in the list may be the one that I use without a doubt in every JavaScript project. And I've got a function here called delete child elements, and it essentially deletes all of the content of whatever element I pass into it. So if we pass in the body, we will delete everything on the page. And you can see here we define a child variable inside the function, and then we set it to parent element dot last element child. And then we say while that exists, we continue to remove the child, and then we reset what the child variable is equal to. It's always equal to the last element until there are no more. Now I've actually seen this done with the first element child, but it works in the same way, whether you use the last or the first. And so if we call delete child elements on the body and we save, now when we look at the body in the console, it doesn't have anything in it. The script tag's gone, the uh, main element we created is gone. It's all gone because we have deleted every child element within the body tag. Utility function number eight is very similar to the select function we created earlier, but this one allows us to pass in a class name as well. So it also has the optional scope as before with the select function, but now we can go ahead and immediately add a class with this selector. So the function is called add class. And if we put in a call here, I'll select the body and we'll pass in the class name purple. And as long as I have a purple class, we'll be able to see what happens with that. So let's go ahead and save. And you can immediately see in the console, body now has a class of purple. And if I go ahead and click on the browser, yes, the background is now purple. Utility function number nine is very useful, and I use it on almost every application as well when I am working with web apps, mobile apps, uh, because most all web apps you could consider to be mobile apps these days. And this function is called isiOS. Sometimes with different platforms, there are different capabilities that you need to be aware of. And so it can be handy in your code to know if you're uh, on an iOS platform versus Windows or Linux. And this is the function that I use for it. Uh, the MS stream is to avoid IE11, so that's getting a little dated now, but it is probably still worth having in there, at least this part about the window.ms stream. And you can use MDN to look up Navigator and the different things that are available there, such as Max touch points and platform. But overall, this tests for iOS. So if I go ahead and call this function, and we're going to log the result with our log function, I'll save this, and I just get a false in the console. However, this function does work, and I have applied it in applications for mobile devices, and it lets me know if I am working with iOS, and then I can apply what might be needed when I am using an iOS or when I am testing an iOS or when the users are on an iOS. And the 10th and final utility function that I am sharing with you today is my get parameters by name from a URL function. And here I've got the get parameter value. So whichever parameter I'm looking for, I pass in as the param name and then I can pass in the URL. And if I don't pass in a URL, as that's optional, then I just set the URL to the window.location.href. 
Now here you can see I am using a regex and this looks for the question mark or the ampersand that usually starts out a parameter and there you can see I just reversed those by mistake. Didn't mean to do that but either way it will look for either one of those. And then I pass in the param name here. This is a template literal. And then there's an exclusion here, which we're making sure there's the equal sign, but then we're excluding that it doesn't start with the ampersand or the hashtag. The hashtag, remember, is also where you, what you see in the URL when you've clicked an anchor link in the page. And the asterisk means that repeats as many times as necessary there. Um, then we set the results to regex.execute, essentially, and then pass in the URL. Now I've got a console login here to show you the results in a second. If there's no results, we return null. And if there's no result in the third position of the array, which I'll show you when I log the results, we just return an empty string, which is also fine for this function. You could change that if you want to, to return null as well. Um, and then we also use a decode URI component here because if there's a plus in there, that indicates a space because a URL should be encoded. So we need to decode that and replace any plus with a space. And so to show you an example of that, let's go ahead and set our param to extract to param2. And then we've got a URL here with param1 and param2. I'm only interested in getting the value of param2. And so to do that, I'm going to go ahead and log And here. I've got console log, but we can just use our previous log function here and we can log the value of the param to extract from the URL. So I'll save this first. And you can see we get Dave Gray because there is the value of param2 and it does have a plus in there to indicate a space. So that's all good. Now let's go ahead and shed just a little bit of light on how this regex works and look at the results from this console log statement inside the function. And if I save this, you can see we get an array with three values. The first value has the ampersand and param2 equals Dave Gray. The second one just has equals Dave Gray and the third one just has the value we want. And so that's why it's of course position zero, position one, position two. So that's why we're using results two over here in the function as you'd see right here and right here as well. And now to highlight this, if you're not as familiar with regex, let's look at this same regex. And I'm using regexer.com. You can see up here in the URL bar. And in this example, we have highlighted param because I just passed in the word param saying that's what I was looking for. And so now it has chosen the question mark param equals test data, but not the second parameter here. And we could change that and tell it we're looking for not param and then it selects the ampersand and the not param and you can see I even put a hashtag after as if we had clicked an anchor on the page. So this is a good place to test out your regex uh, equations I guess or expressions there's the word expressions that you're putting together and I do have a tutorial on regex that I can link to right now but yeah uh, Test this out, and of course, what I'm interested in seeing is everyone else's utility functions. I've got some interest in this as well. I could learn some things from you. So if you have a great utility function or a great regex pattern, please share those with me in the comments below, or even better, link to a gist on GitHub where we can all just see that code and it's much easier to read than it is in the comments. But either way, please share your code and go ahead and use these functions I've shared today. Hey, thank you so much for watching and subscribing. I appreciate it. The channel is growing. I look forward to your comments every week, and I'll talk to you guys again very soon.